All right, now we're going to ch discuss chapter <clears throat> 24, macroevolution, or essentially the process by which new species form, a process which, uh, compared to microevolution, takes some time. Um, but first, we need to define what a species is. And a common way is what's known as the biological species concept. That is, a species are groups of organisms that are reproductively isolated from each other. Let's look here. So, for example, these two species of metal arc, one is the eastern and one is the western, they sort of look awful similar to each other, but yet they do not breed with each other, so they are reproductively isolated. Where on the other hand, when we look at people, of course people are a lot different in appearance from each other due to their ancestry, but of course um, all people can reproduce with each other, so we are not reproductively isolated, so we are of course one single species. Now, what can generate reproductive barriers between um, groups of individuals? Um, we can divide them up between what are called prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. Prezygotic, as the name suggests, um, occurring before or preventing the formation of a zygote, essentially preventing fertilization. Now, of course, two organisms can reside in completely different habitats, which means they never get together to even attempt to produce offspring, so we consider them separate species. They can be separated in time, that is temporal isolation, so one might be active at night and the other during the day, so again they never come in contact. Behavioral isolation, they have behaviors that either reinforce to them that they are the same species, or in this case they do not recognize each other as the same species because of behavioral differences, and so that can reinforce that they are different species. For example, with these blue-footed boobies here from the Galapagos, they have this rather elaborate mating ritual, these, this dance they do, and that lets the males and females know that they are of the same species. They're, they recognize their behaviors. And so under these, it essentially precludes even attempting to mate. Now you can get attempts at mating, but it could be that the parts don't quite fit together so well, and so even though they may attempt to mate, it's not successful. You can get successful mating, but the gametes might be incompatible so fertilization doesn't occur. So all those are prezygotic. Postzygotic, so you may have successful mating and you might have the formation of a hybrid, but in some cases the hybrids are not terribly viable, they just don't survive very well. In other cases the hybrids are not, they're of low fertility or essentially no fertility, so as the case with the mule, the mule is a hybrid between a donkey and a horse but mules are sterile, so essentially even though they form a hybrid, that hybrid is a dead end, so we consider mules and horses separate species. Hybrids may form, may be fertile, but over time those hybrid individuals, that group of hybrids may lose that fertility and viability, so essentially the hybrids break down and they don't persist. So again, we would consider the hybridizing species as separate species. Now, we also have the morphological species concept, which is based on how things look, and this um, is also a common way of differentiating between species like grizzly bears and polar bears. They look a lot different. Um, however, they can successfully form a hybrid. I, I don't know the exact status of this hybrid, whether they persist or not, or how often they form, but grizzly bears and polar bears tend to inhabit different habitats, so that habitat isolation tends to reinforce this species difference between them. Um, the morphological species concept is quite useful for extinct species, things you only find in the fossil record. We can't know by just looking at a fossil whether two different types could mate with each other or even attempt to. So we're kind of stuck with looking at the morphological differences and um, assuming that they are most likely different species. So for example, these two species um, of the genus Homo are, are found at approximately the same time, but they're significantly different enough that we assume 
they are different species. Now we also have the ecological species concept, which looks at ecological function. What do organisms do in the environment? Where do they live? And so, for example, E. coli and Listeria are both bacilli types of bacteria. And so when you look at them, you can't really tell the difference between them so much. But when we study what they do, we see that they are quite different from each other um, in where they live and how they function. Phylogenetic species concept. So it's, um, I think, a bit more amorphous, confusing perhaps. And here, this is straight out of the book. Smallest group of individuals that share a common ancestor forming one branch on the tree of life. So what you do is um, you use different kinds of data, like morphological data, molecular data, data from DNA, RNA, proteins. And using those differences, you clump them on trees or phylogenies and see where they fall out. And so those individuals that fall on a particular branch based on these data we describe as a distinct species, and again, based on the tree, the phylogenetic species concept. <coughs> okay, section two. Now, the process of speciation. How do we go from one species to two or more species? So it's thought to happen a couple different ways, what's called allopatric and sympatric. And so starting with a single species inhabiting the same area, if, those, if that species gets divided into two separate populations, here you can see so the lake level has dropped such that now you have these two separate subpopulations. Over time, they're not isolated from each other. They can start to take different evolutionary pathways such that they become differentiated and we can call them separate species. Sympatric speciation is when they inhabit the same habitat, but due to um, um, behavioral differences that develop, uh, chance events, they might begin to mate preferentially and begin to form separate species. Sympatric in the same habitat, allopatric, there's separation. So here, is what we think is a good example of allopatric, these ground squirrels that one inhabits the the north side of the Grand Canyon or the not the canyon itself but the north rim and then the south rim of the Grand Canyon and so they clearly are geographically isolated from each other they've taken different evolutionary pathways and are considered separate species um, here, this is this uh, salamander that's mentioned in the book, the Allegheny Mountain Dusky Salamander. And what we see with this species is that when um, within the whole sp species, all the different subpopulations within that species, the more distant they are from each other, the more reproductively isolated they are from each other. That is, they tend not to mate with each other or maybe not even recognize each other, even though they're the same species. And so when they're, of course, closer together, there's less reproductive isolation, which kind of makes sense. And so um, this creates the conditions under which those more distant populations, ones that are more distant from each other, can begin to differentiate more. And this could potentially lead to speciation over time. Now, sympatric speciation within the same habitat. Um, some good examples of this. Now, in our picture, they show fish. And there are these types of fish known as cichlids. And they have been known to most likely have reproduced or, or, or evolved into separate species sympatically. They occupy the same lakes, but due to sort of slight niche differentiation within that lake, they begin to form subpopulations and then separate species. In plants, there's some good examples due to what's called polyploidy. And polyploidy is when you go from um, sort of having a single 
set of chromosomes to having multiple sets of chromosomes from having two copies of each chromosome to having four copies or six copies. And so autopolyploidy is one way this can happen where you go from one species that then is able to produce a second species that has an extra set of chromosomes. This can happen due to mistakes in mitosis where you form particular branches on that plant that may have extra sets of chromosomes which then can produce seeds and well offspring essentially that are polyploids. It can also happen due to the getting together of what we would call unreduced gametes within that species and a pollen grain that has is unreduced and an egg that's unreduced and if those two unreduced gametes happen to get together they can form a polyploid and so this polyploid is now essentially because of the number of chromosomes it tends to be isolated from the original diploid progenitors of it allopolyploidy and this is when you get two different species that hybridize to form a, another polyploid species and so here we've got A and B and they've got a different number of chromosomes they hybridize one produces a normal chromosome one produces an unreduced gamete they produce a hybrid that has seven chromosomes and so having an odd number of chromosomes this individual is going to be sterile because the chromosomes don't match up but being a plant it has um, relative to animals the ability to produce asexually we'll say and so that hybrid can persist through time until the opportunity arises when it sort of back hybridizes with one of the progenitor species so you get the seven chromosomes combining with the three and now you have an species that has an even number of chromosomes and now it will be most likely sexually fertile and you've got your hybrid polyploid species that's formed between two different species getting together um, okay so we'll cover sections three and four in the next video